Today, let's continue discussing Jenna and Worsham's Random Acts of Medicine. This is the fifth part of the interpretation. In China, there's a saying, if not a good prime minister, then a good doctor. Suggesting that doctors possess the qualities of a good prime minister. Why is that? I understand it's because the job of a doctor involves weighing many pros and cons. For instance, when an elderly patient has a heart attack, upon examination, you might find coronary artery blockage. In the doctor's toolbox, there are several options. One is medication without surgery, another is installing a stent in the coronary artery to relieve blockage. A minimally invasive procedure. The more fundamental option is bypassing the blocked artery, adding a new vessel, creating a new blood flow route, known as coronary artery bypass grafting, CABG. A major open heart surgery. Which option do you choose? You must consider not only the severity of the condition but also the risks of the surgery. It's a challenging decision. This is similar to a country facing an economic downturn. The government's toolbox has various options. Continue laissez-faire, wait for economic recovery. Implement an active monetary policy, such as lowering interest rates. Directly engage in fiscal policy, like taking on debt for infrastructure development. Stimulate too little, and it might be ineffective. Stimulate too much, and the government disrupts market order. Should you use Keynes or Hayek? Similarly, a common chronic arrhythmia, atrial fibrillation, AFib, involves the atrium's irregular beating. AFib patients are likely to form blood clots in the heart, potentially leading to a stroke. One way to prevent clots is by using anticoagulants, which prevent blood clotting. Using anticoagulants can prevent strokes, but they also increase the risk of bleeding in patients, as blood clotting becomes less likely. If a patient experiences bleeding in the brain or gastrointestinal tract due to anticoagulants, the risk might outweigh the benefits of preventing a stroke. Now, with a patient in front of you with AFib, would you prescribe anticoagulants? In economic terms, it's like saying the market has low liquidity, people are unwilling to invest or consume. Should the government lower interest rates? Lowering rates seems like it could stimulate investment and consumption, but it might lead to capital flowing abroad, decreasing the exchange rate. Do you use this strategy? So, you see, doctors indeed possess the qualities of a good prime minister, especially when the decisions involve matters of life and death. Not all professions among the all trades require such weighing of pros and cons. For example, programmers rarely need to weigh pros and cons. They receive a task, and they get it done, still earning high salaries. Hospitals are excellent places for studying human decision-making. Medical schools have courses specifically teaching scientific decision-making, covering cognitive biases mentioned by Daniel Kahneman. Many doctors have undergone such training. In the U.S., some resident doctors regularly participate in a learning program called the Clinical Reasoning Exercise, CREX, teaching doctors how to think when caring for patients, making diagnoses, and deciding on treatment plans. This is metacognitive training, an understanding of their own thought processes. There's also simulated decision-making training. Sometimes, using models or actors, a scenario is presented to doctors. A patient experiencing sudden cardiac arrest, with real medical equipment on hand. And they have to decide what to do. Afterward, teammates and observers evaluate their decisions, studying ways to improve. However, scientific decision-making is challenging. Generally, when doctors face the situations mentioned earlier, how do they make decisions? Jenna and Worsham's Random Acts of Medicine explores two common decision-making methods in hospitals, both of which have significant issues. The first method is the threshold decision, judging based on a number, akin to determining if food is still edible by checking the expiration date on the package. Of course, you know the expiration date is arbitrarily set by humans, and it's impossible for something to suddenly spoil on that exact day. Doctors understand this, but they are strongly influenced. For doctors, the most critical threshold number is age. For example, 
if you are an emergency department doctor and just received a patient with rapid breathing and chest tightness, you must quickly assess the likely condition and order necessary tests. If the patient is in their 20s, you might suspect asthma. But if the patient is in their 70s, you are more likely to suspect a heart attack. This is just an initial assessment, and further tests will be scheduled. However, this preliminary judgment strongly influences the subsequent treatment direction. You see, the same symptoms, just because of different ages, lead to different paths. In the doctor's mind, the age threshold for heart conditions is 40. Patients over 40 are more likely to have heart problems, while those under 40 are considered less likely. Now, a natural experiment arises. A patient who recently turned 40 and a patient who is a few days away from turning 40 should not have essential differences in their physical conditions. After all, a person doesn't suddenly age on their birthday. But do these two patients show significant differences in heart disease tests and diagnoses? A study in the book divided the ages of emergency patients into three-month intervals, examining the likelihood of patients between 35 and 45 being asked to undergo heart disease tests. The results are as follows. In this graph, it's evident that older patients are more likely to undergo heart disease tests, forming a continuous line. However, around the age of 40, there's a sudden jump in that line. Compared to patients just shy of turning 40, Patients who recently turned 40 have a 9.5% relatively increased likelihood of being asked to undergo heart disease tests. Diagnoses follow a similar pattern. At the age of 40, the probability of a person being diagnosed with heart disease suddenly increases by 19.3%. This may be related to the tests or the subjective judgment of doctors after the tests. Your heart certainly doesn't undergo significant changes on your 40th birthday. This is a cognitive bias among doctors. This bias is reminiscent of the left-digit bias we've discussed before, where pricing an item at $9.99 feels different from pricing it at $10, even though there's no actual difference. This threshold effect is the opposite of the representativeness bias we mentioned earlier concerning students' birthdays. Here, it exaggerates age differences. It turns out that the age of a patient with an illness significantly affects doctors' judgments. For instance, the age threshold for coronary artery bypass grafting CAB, surgery is 80. Doctors generally believe that beyond 80 is a critical point. Patients over 80 are less suitable for CAB surgery. The statistics in the graph support this. The probability of undergoing CAB surgery suddenly jumps around the patient's 80th birthday, but there's no such jump around 78, 79, 81, or 82 years old. Does it mean that whether a doctor decides to perform surgery on you depends on whether you just passed your 80th birthday or will do so next week? Indeed. If a kidney donor is just under 70, their kidney is likely to be kept for donation. But if they just turn 70, it's likely to be discarded. Even if you compare the indicators of the two kidneys, you'll find they are essentially the same. The crucial age for rectal cancer is 60. If a patient under 60 is diagnosed with rectal cancer, doctors are more likely to recommend aggressive treatments such as surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy. However, if the patient is over 60, doctors are more likely to opt for conservative treatment. Another significant age is 18. For hospitals, patients under 18 are considered children, and those over 18 are adults. The treatment methods and even the doctors they see may differ. One typical difference is whether or not to prescribe opioid painkillers. In the graph, between just before and after 18 years old, the probability of patients being prescribed opioid painkillers suddenly increases from just under 14% to over 15%. Threshold decisions are blunt. Ideally, doctors should comprehensively assess a patient's physical condition, considering factors such as height, weight, cardiovascular function, underlying diseases, and more. However, doctors don't have such complex models. Decisions about schooling, employment, retirement, and the like also consider age, right? Age is a simple and powerful criterion, inevitably leading to crude decisions. 
Another decision-making method is the Winstay slash lose shift heuristic. For example, if I have two methods, A and B, in my toolbox, and I use a this time. If it succeeds, I'm more likely to stick with a next time. If it fails, I'm more likely to switch to B. This sounds reasonable but lacks logic. Suppose you're an obstetrician gynecologist. Every day, for every woman giving birth, you must make a crucial decision. Whether she should have a natural birth or a cesarean section. Of course, you consider various factors to make a scientific judgment. But if your last patient experienced complications during natural childbirth, would you be more inclined to recommend a cesarean section to the next patient? In theory, there's no connection between two patients, and each judgment should be entirely independent. However, economists, after extensive statistical analysis, found a faint tendency in doctors' decisions, a Winstay slash lose shift inclination. If the previous patient had complications with one method, the likelihood of the doctor choosing another method for the next patient slightly increases. The number isn't significant, but indeed, there are babies born in a certain way just because the doctor's previous patient used a different method. Research shows that decisions regarding atrial fibrillation, AFib, and anticoagulants exhibit clear Winstay slash lose shift features. If a doctor prescribes anticoagulants to an AFib patient, and that patient subsequently experiences bleeding, the doctor's probability of prescribing anticoagulants to the next AFib patient decreases. And this hesitation persists for about a year. It's not about being overly cautious due to a single bad experience. It's about excessive learning from the lesson. After World War I, Germany, on one hand, needed to pay war reparations according to the Versailles Treaty and, on the other hand, aimed to stimulate the economy. It adopted an extremely loose monetary policy, essentially printing a significant amount of money. However, the unintentional consequence was hyperinflation, causing immense anger among the citizens. Interestingly, this sentiment played a crucial role in Hitler's rise to power. After that, Germany learned its lesson. This lesson has persisted until today, and the German government is afraid to use the tool of loose monetary policy, fearing inflation. Economists argue that a certain level of inflation can be beneficial at times, but it's not a tool in Germany's toolbox. Interestingly, the other side of the wind stay. Slash lose shift doesn't hold true. If a doctor didn't prescribe anticoagulants to an AFib patient, and that patient later had a stroke, it doesn't increase the probability of the doctor prescribing anticoagulants to the next patient. Why? Because the emotional response to bad things happening due to inaction is different from the emotional response to bad things happening due to action. Yes, you didn't prescribe anticoagulants, but the patient might have had a stroke for various reasons. Perhaps their constitution predisposed them to a stroke. However, if the patient has bleeding due to the doctor prescribing anticoagulants, that's unequivocally the doctor's responsibility. Yet, you know, this internal calculation is merely psychological. This decision should ideally be symmetric. Doctors are professional, high-frequency decision-makers, often dealing with matters of life and death. They've tried many methods to improve their decision-making skills. They've undergone specialized training and even forced themselves to consider issues from opposing perspectives. However, they are still human. They can't be perfect decision-makers. We've discussed decision-making topics many times before, and will continue to do so in the future. For doctors, their job demands the skills of a good prime minister, yet they're doing everyday things. This is somewhat unfair. But that's the nature of being a doctor. In the next section, we will discuss how to become a good doctor. If you feel there is value in this, please like, subscribe to this channel, and leave your thoughts or suggestions in the comments section. Let's grow together and read more good books.